Good evening and welcome to the annual meeting of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. My name is Daniel Bausch. I'm the scientific program chair. The scientific program committee works really an incredibly difficult but nevertheless rewarding job throughout the year to bring an excellent program. Of course, I'm biased, but I think this is a great program for, for us again this year um, with all the science, all the public health, all the clinical medicine, all the other things, and, and many, many extras I think that you'll see. So um, I, I, uh, I hope you'll enjoy the, the week together, and we're really happy to have you here. I'd like to make a, a special welcome each time to our young trainees, to the students, uh, to people for whom this is the first meeting. We hope that this will be a long and productive relationship with the society as it has been for many of us in the room and, and, uh, and a give and take. And so we, uh, we definitely hope we can give a lot to you. We hope that we can ask a lot of you in contributing to the society and that'll be worth it for everyone. The other group that I'd like to make a special welcome to are our international members. It's been, of course, a, a turbulent year, perhaps, of coming to the United States, and, and we're lucky to have so many that, that really make that journey and come. I want to recognize this year um, five members who have come from a long way and, and perhaps a difficult place to come from. And so we have uh, five Iraqi scientists who have joined us this year, this year, and I'm going to give their name and, and ask them to stand. And so if you would, please, Mohammed uh, Al Kortas and <laughs> Iklas Khalid <laughs> Tagreed Al Hadari <laughs> Ibitsin Khalid Saleh. and Mohammed Jale. So, so we, we definitely welcome you. Thanks so much for coming. And, and I know there, there are many others who have come from uh, far away. And of course, we can't mention all of you tonight, but you, you're, you're certainly welcome. Don't miss, by the way, uh, uh, what will certainly be a very promising um, symposium given by our Iraqi investigators and, and colleagues on medical education and public health in Iraq. And, and you can find that, of course, along with all the rest of the program on your awesome app puts together. Um, and so we, we have, uh, we've heard you over the years. There's a, there's a great app, there's Wi-Fi here, and so you should be well connected for those things. A, a few last thank yous before we get on with our program. First of all, as I mentioned, um, this is the, the the culmination of the scientific program committee, many people who are filtering through, of course, the abstracts and the, the symposia that you submit and working out all the details of, of all the things that are presented here. So very much a very big thanks to them and also to the administrative team at Kellen. This seems, uh, I hope, like a, a seamless event that comes off very easily, but of course it takes a lot of work on the, administra the administrative side to put that together. And then there are many sponsors that uh, I'd like to thank um, before we move on. And uh, so going through those, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Takeda Pharmaceuticals International, ACS Publications, uh, Celgene Corporation, Tech Lab Incorporated, Bayer, Sanofi Pasteur, Biomed Central, PLOS, and Elsevier are our sponsors. Our supporters are the Burroughs Welcome Fund, Sanofi Pasteur, International Association for Medical Assistance for Travelers and Gilead. And then lastly, a few um, donors that we'd like to very warmly thank, William A. Petrie Sr. and, uh, and Dr. Ann E. Petrie Tech Labs, the Petrie family. One anonymous donor, um, maybe you're out there, thanks very much, and, uh, and then PLOS NTDs. Um, lastly, don't miss all the, the things that are in the exhibit hall starting tonight with a reception which will be um, here in the swing hall on level 100 of the convention center. Thanks very much for coming. I will now turn it over to ASTMH President Patricia Walker. Thank you, Dan. I'd like to thank you as well. You've done another outstanding job directing this year's scientific program along with Stephanie, Yano, and the entire, mem all the members of the scientific program committee. I didn't know until this year that we have more than 110 members on that committee. It's, so thank you all for your work. The society would be unable to do 
what we do without your efforts. Thanks for a great annual meeting. Really looking forward to it. Hello. Sawadika. Chumriyap Sur. Mingalaba. Hola. Jambo. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, everyone, to the 66th Annual International American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene Meeting. What a year it has been for us as a society for tropical medicine and hygiene and global health in general. We've seen natural disasters here on the shores of the United States, as well as south of us in the Caribbean islands, Mexico and South America, and overseas in Sierra Leone. We are experiencing man-made disasters as well in war-torn Yemen, where an unprecedented cholera epidemic is taking place and with forced human migration at a historic level. And we have a political climate in the US like one we have never seen before, with funding threats to the health and well-being of our world. I can assure you that the society remains deeply engaged in work and advocacy to address these issues. But as I look out on all the faces here tonight, so many familiar faces, so many new faces from here in the US and internationally, I can sense the ex excitement and anticipation of everyone. And it makes me realize that for all that's going on in the world that we do have this as society and what we will see and experience this week together is really very special and unique and it gives me great hope for the future. We are expecting about 4,400 of our colleagues this week from more than 100 countries. And as we mingle and network among each other, speaking and listening and learning, we will do so respectfully, amicably, and professionally. It's what science diplomacy is really about. Because this international ASTMH is what gives us our strength and inspires us toward our ultimate goal, a world free of tropical infectious diseases. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Farmer. Many of you know his work. Paul is a medical anthropologist and physician who has dedicated his life to improving healthcare for the world's poorest people. He's co-founder and chief strategist for Partners in Health, the highly respected and influential international nonprofit organization that since 1987 has directed has provided direct healthcare services and undertaken research and advocacy on behalf of those who are sick and living in poverty. Paul and his colleagues in the US and abroad have pioneered novel community-based treatment strategies that demonstrate the ability to deliver high quality healthcare in resource poor settings. He has written extensively on health, human rights, and the consequences of social inequality. His message tonight and the key themes that he touches on will resonate in the meeting rooms, in the hallways, and during the discourse throughout this week. Please welcome Dr. Paul Farmer. Thank you. These blinding lights mean that I don't have to be anxious since I can't see any of you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure um, to be back at this nice people meeting. Um, you know, on one, on, some time ago I gave a talk at these meetings about the history of colonial medicine and, and therefore our own roots, um, but no buts, period. Um, thank you for those who are chuckling. Um, if there was ever a professional society, a medical society that has embraced um, the equity agenda, embraced inclusiveness um, at scientific meetings, um, embraced trainees and students. I understand a third of us gathered here are trainees or students. I can't think of any other. And it is an honor as, as ever uh, to be a member of this society and to be invited to speak. Um, I was invited by Patricia to address this topic. I took you quite literally the failure of imagination. Um, and it's easy to say, uh, she already busted me that I am uh, an anthropologist, which is a highly scientific discipline. You get a PhD just by schmoozing with people, <laughs> which I think is terrific. You learn a lot by listening, of course, and you're supposed to do that in clinical medicine. I just want to think a little bit about how we re-socialize our understandings of tropical medicine without going back on a historical tour 
and underlining, as, as Patricia already did, um, the moment that we're living now um, in terms of climate, um, in terms of uh, political instability, in terms of movement of migrations across national borders, um, and in terms of global health, which is different from global health equity. This is, uh, this, when, I, when I reach southern Haiti, and many people here in this room have spent time in Haiti, um, it looked to me like this hurricane struck part of Haiti, again, had been torched or reminded me a little bit of the earthquake in, in 2010. And the difference was, of course, that the larger concrete buildings are the ones that fell during the earthquake. And the little shacks and, uh, with tin roofs or sometimes thatch roofs were too small to fail. But that's not what happened when Hurricane Matthew sat on southern Haiti for um, days with 140 mile an hour winds. Uh, one woman explained to me that they had lost their roof first and they sought shelter in a concrete house. And then, as she put it, their chickens exploded. And, you know, again, listening to people, it just would not have occurred to me, my last name aside, that livestock, even medium-sized ones, would be uh, killed in, an earth, in, in, a, uh, in a storm like that. And in spite of climate change deniers, we know that this is the result of, um, I'm not saying this particular hurricane, but we know that extreme uh, uh, climate variation is related to human activity, and that's another kind of resocializing activity. And I want to focus a little bit on, uh, I'm just going to focus on Ebola because I suspect that Dan Bausch was also behind uh, my invitation back. Where did he go? Somewhere. Oh, there you are. I should have seen the shine. <laughs> He's a good friend, so I'm allowed to. Was a good friend, he just said. Um, I'm also grateful, of course, to have been given space in the, in the journal um, to think about uh, resocializing epidemics. This one was about cholera. And the general point um, that I'd like to make, which is not new, um, but it keeps recurring again and again, is when we have scientific progress, which is largely the fruit of basic scientific research. We have new preventives. They may be vaccines. We have new diagnostics, many of them molecular, uh, in, 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 or relying on molecular platforms, and we have new therapies. Um, and we fail every time to pull together an equity plan. And so, as Louise Ivers, who was honored by the society um, the year that we wrote this together, um, she, uh, she's at Harvard and Mass General, as a couple of my friends from Mass General are here tonight. When when cholera struck Haiti, it was the same tired logic um, that comes largely from development economics, again, that highly non-ideological and technical field. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and those arguments sounded like this, and they'll be familiar to anyone who's worked as a clinician, and, um, that a, a new development is not cost effective, not sustainable, not feasible, not a priority. Um, and the, the, that logic has its place, but it has now come to overwhelm, and has now for at least two or three decades, overwhelm other kinds of logic, including the equity logic that Patricia just laid out in her opening, or in her welcome. And in this particular instance, and some of you know the story, um, one of my classmates from medical school is a cholera expert, and he's here tonight. There was a vaccine that hadn't been around the last time cholera made its world tour. I happen to have been there for the tail end of the, th that American pandemic, um, which ran up and down the coastline of South America. I was working in Peru, uh, across the Caribbean. It was a very similar story. It somehow seemed to have spared Haiti uh, raising questions of, you know, immunologically naive populations um, and exploded there. And many people believed that that was because of the earthquake, um, but that is not the case. Uh, in fact, the earthquake affected zones were among the less affected by cholera because people were in camps and drinking 
uh, purified water. The most vulnerable populations were rural areas not affected by the earthquake. And I know this because it's ripped right through the area of Haiti where I've been lucky enough to work for 35 years. A humiliation in a way, right, for our work, because although we could drop case fatality, which is nothing to dismiss, um, there was no way to make up for um, an absence of long-term and sustained, not sustainable, sustained investments in water and sanitation. And the way this translated um, this uh, was, again, now we have to focus on sanitation, so let's not get distracted by uptake of this new vaccine. It started immediately, um, whereas the cholera vaccine, the new cholera vaccine, had already gone through trials, had already been shown to increase herd immunity and already been shown to decrease the size of, um, and the mortality of epidemics in a number of settings in the world. And again, people in the society have been involved in that research uh, and in those trials. And that is not the reason, but it is among the reasons that this epidemic went completely out of control, exploding like a bomb across first central, then the Artibonite regions of Haiti, and then the rest of the country. And uh, a million people uh, were thought to be afflicted within a few years, and 6,000 died in the first year. You know, unprecedented uh, mortality, alas, in the, I mean, unprecedented in the Americas. And, uh, and has caused a number of um, ongoing political and social problems uh, that might have been lessened, at the very least, by gung-ho efforts to introduce uh, new technologies, not as a replacement for the basic investments in water and sanitation, but as a complement to them. Now, does this happen again? Right? Everybody who's an anthropologist, and by the way, I am a proud one. I'm not mocking my discipline. It's still hard to write those books. Um, context matters, right? Too obvious to say. Um, but look at some of the commentary you have heard about the Ebola epidemic. Um, and I'm not talking about the commentary of scientists, although one wonders where these ideas came from that were so widely echoed in the popular press. And by popular press, I mean mainstream press. Um, context matters. Obviously, uh, that was the example I gave. The first picture is in Haiti after the earthquake. The second is a recent photograph um, that was in the Wall Street Journal from a town where we started working uh, in Liberia, uh, Harper, the capital of Maryland County. And some people here have been there. It's in the far southeast, and it had been a hub um, of development, even a vacation resort for affluent Liberians, and this is what it looks like now, still. It looks like the war was over um, just last week. Um, and that's because the investments that were required not to rebuild homes, but to rebuild or build for the first time a health system um, were not made after the wars ended there. Um, in Sierra Leone in 2001, 2002, uh, and in Liberia uh, a few years later. Now, why, why Guinea? Well, Dan Bausch has, has explored this in one of the most thoughtful uh, papers that I've seen in the journal, um, or that I've seen anywhere. Um, and that is, if you look at Guinea, the same sorts of ecological pressures exist. And the war affected Guinea in very direct ways. A quarter of the population of Sierra Leone was, took refuge in Guinea. There were camps like this all over that part of the uh, all over that country, and the region where Ebola was held to have started was also profoundly disrupted over long, even centuries, and there's ample documentation of, uh, of the various extractive trades that have reduced not just the forest, um, but stability and given way um, to kind of conflict that you saw most explosively in Sierra Leone and Liberia. So when someone asks, um, well, why those three countries and no others? Has Nigeria, Mali, Senegal, Spain, the United States, um, secondary transmission occurred there, but it was nothing compared to the epicenter, which was largely constrained to these three countries. Just remember, as Dan Bausch said in his piece, that that's where Ebola, and many other pieces, I should add, that's where Ebola epidemics occur, after conflict and without a health system 
that is able to diagnose uh, and respond to at the same time um, a, a, an affliction. Now, just to go uh, talk, to talk a little bit about this, um, zoonoses that pop out of forested obscurity uh, and um, reach urban areas um, are old news in, in our field. Um, and, you know, just these first two are the filoviruses, Marburg and, and Ebola, um, are increasingly well known and certainly well known here. Um, but HIV has a similar story. And each one of them, uh, of the Ebola epidemics and the Marburg epidemics, have been characterized by uh, disease that's transmitted through caregiving. This is a caregiver's disease. And that's true whether you're talking about traditional healers, as they're called. Um, in, the abs in a clinical desert, people will always seek care. And if there aren't physicians and nurses, um, then they will seek it from anyone else. But the majority of care, um, even for acute illnesses, is delivered by in families. And the last act of caregiving, you don't have to be a Catholic to believe this. In fact, most people in Sierra Leone are Muslims. The last act of caregiving is burial. And my grandmothers would be very proud of me standing here and remembering one of the seven corporal works of mercy is to bury the dead. There's no society that's well described by anthropologists or anyone else where this isn't the case. It was very much the case in the United States until it was outsourced at the beginning of the 20th century to a very expensive profession. As for kissing and touching corpses, um, I'm getting on in age, but I can tell you that when my father died, it's exactly what Catholic families did and maybe still do. These are not the exotica that reach the popular press um, in accounts of uh, why this explosive epidemic did reach cities. If you're an infectious disease doctor, and this is kind of what we do, no offense, but we like to show off a long list of differential diagnoses. But really, fever, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, uh, it, it could be anything. Choleric presentation malaria. The malariologists here will know that that's in every textbook about malaria. Um, and we don't even use those terms anymore because we have better diagnostics. And the more they're deployed, the less we have to talk about clinical patterns that may give a tip um, to clinicians. But basically, this requires staff, stuff, space, and systems. And the, and the space means laboratory uh, capacity. And as again, Dan has pointed out, uh, as, as regards Ebola. And the stuff, the, the tools of the trade, which must include tools for caregivers, right? To have a research capacity alone or a diagnostic capacity alone, people don't come saying, what is my diagnosis? They're saying, what is my diagnosis and what is going to happen and how do I avoid that fate? And indeed, that is what happened in West Africa, Upper West Africa, um, from 2014 for the, to the year, in the year that followed. Um, so staff dust based in systems, um, if you have one bit of this without the other, if you have the staff but don't have laboratory capacity, if you have laboratory buildings but no um, diagnostics and supply chain, um, if you don't have systems, meaning in this case infection control, you're going to see nosocomial and lab-based tr transmission of these pathogens. And I say these pathogens, I'm not, not talking about filovirus, but communicable pathogens. And uh, a lot of my work has been on tuberculosis. Um, it's the same story there. It is a caregiver's disease, uh, but it's airborne, and of course has a different pattern of spread. Um, and, and, and more likely to blanket a household um, uh, or a community, especially the lung blocks of the early 20th century in the United States. But Ebola, again, is strikingly patterned as a caregiver's disease. Now, to go to a couple people we've honored here before, um, and one of them, uh, actually a number of people here are friends with at least two of these three, and some of you will know the third who came to the meetings, I think, last year. Um, these are three of the four Sierra Leoneans I knew. First time I went there in the summer of 2014. I'd never set foot there. It was for a surgical conference. I have had surgeons say to me many times, well, you're an infectious disease doctor, and you're interested in surgery? 
First of all, I'm interested in what people need, and surgical care is usually part of that, even in infectious disease. But in other words, we shouldn't allow our professional training to confuse the matter, uh, especially when it involves a near absence of staff stuff, space, and systems. And it's worse now. Two of these three people um, participated, and the, the fourth one as well, in that surgical conference. And that's because they only one of them, Martin Salia, in the middle, is, was a surgeon. Uh, two of them were. The other one isn't pictured. Um, they wanted to see their country become less of a clinical desert, and a clinical desert that is a public health desert as well. And by November of that year, again, as Dan has said in his beautiful paper, um, two of them were dead of Ebola, Martin Salia, Martin Salia and, and, and Humar Khan. Um, now, what did we hear in the popular media? Turns out, by the way, that uh, the President of the Republic now, the United States, tweeted 102 times about Ebola. I didn't know this because I was with my colleagues in, in West Africa. Let's just say very few, if any of them, were kind-hearted. And some of them were directed against clinicians, uh, including at least one of these, but also Americans returning from service in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, or, or anywhere near them. You know? And Dan has some stories to tell. He'll give me a green light one day to share some of them about the meetings in New Orleans. I love New Orleans. Can we go back there, Dan? Yeah, I know, I know. But I'm actually trying to make myself smile because this is a painful topic, I'm sure, for many of you. But the cover of Newsweek, which you see in the corner, uh, I think appeared after Humar Khan died on July 29th, uh, along with a great number of the nurses who had worked with members of the society, uh, including Dan. Um, that's not what this was about, the exotica. And historians of epidemic disease and anthropologists uh, have, have a heyday, but usually some years too late, um, talking about the way in which uh, epidemics on that continent almost invariably are exoticized in this fashion. This is the paper that I referred to, Dan's paper. Um, and it, 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 it is, I believe, the most uh, honest uh, assessment of some of the things that went wrong in the middle of that epidemic, at least as concerns uh, Sierra Leone. And I would encourage everyone to read it. But there was laboratory capacity. It was the only place not too far across the border from Guinea where you could diagnose a hemorrhagic fever, two of them, Lassa and Ebola. Uh, but the epidemic was hidden away until I believe it was May 25th when the first two cases in Sierra Leone were diagnosed by laboratory capacity. It turns out that by March, the World Health Organization and the Ministry of Health of Guinea had already documented a number of cases uh, in Sierra Leone um, just by tracing, uh, tracing the um, movements of patients with known or alleged cases of, um, of Ebola and connections to what was held to be patient zero. Again, a dubious construct, um, but one that did make the papers. Um, a research lab alone, however, does not give you the staff stuff, space, and systems that are required to respond to a caregiver's disease and to provide what people are after, which is care. And that would have been true in the United States. That would be true in Europe. That would have been true even in Berkeley, California. I'm kidding. It was the same story with non-professionals. They were caregivers, too. These are three of, these people have become my friends. I, there, there's another uh, survivor there. And again, these are people who have been included in a number of meetings organized by Dan, by Ian Crozier, and I don't know who else from that crowd is here. These are all Sierra Leoneans. The nice portrait with the three people is a classic enough story. Um, the young woman with the pink, ever since Radiology, I cannot tell left from right. The young woman where the right lung would be. Her grandfather was a traditional healer. Her father, they were living in Freetown. She and her father were living in Freetown, as many people did have after the war. Um, her father's father was a traditional healer, and he was out in 
a rural area. He got sick, his son went to care for him, buried him, came back to Freetown, he got sick. Her best friend, where the left lung would be, um, to helped her take care of him, and her partner um, uh, helped bury her father. Then they all fell sick, and their baby died. The other fellow um, with the plaid shirt, his name's Ibrahim, I remember a very striking, um, very striking evening. It was in, at the height of the, um, gotta have some levity in this, you know, or I get slowed down. We don't get choked up in, at the society meetings, but it was uh, at the height of the Western surge, as it was called by many epidemiologists, as the disease went from east to west. As Freetown and Port Loco um, became the epicenters on the, uh, toward the coast, on the coast, the epicenters of the epidemic, we started, uh, even in October, having um, survivors' meetings. And we would have dinner for them, we still do. And some people said, well, you can't have dinner for Ebola survivors at the Radisson. Which I said, oh yeah, you watch. You have a credit card or cash, no one will object. And they have not. And the last one of these folks that I met uh, in the uh, picture there is a young man named Ibrahim. And I hadn't met him, so I got to sit next to him. This is, again, in late November of 2014. And he told me that he had lost 22 members of his family to Ebola. And I didn't know what to say. Um, you know, what kind of infectious pathogen kills 22 members of a family? There are not a lot of them. Um, and and I'd spent a lot of time with them in the years since then. And um, I got up to 21, and I'm sure I'll find out kinship being complicated, even for anthropologists in this part of the world. I'm sure I'll find out uh, who the 22nd was. Devastating impact, again, um, as a result of the lack of a healthcare system. And there was a chance to rebuild the healthcare system, and it happened after a catastrophe. And that was an Ebola, that was war. And now we, maybe the window is closed, but there was a chance to do it again after Ebola when the world's, world's attention settled fitfully and shortly on the epidemic. One of the best ways to look at equity um, as a tropical medicine, the only reason I had quotation marks around tropical medicine is because latitude is not the primary determinant of where tropical diseases occur. Malaria was across the Mississippi a region way up north, Boston had cases of malaria. It's really about poverty as much as anything. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, and we all know what they are, but they're really tropical diseases that are tied as closely as, as Patricia said to poverty um, and migration and, and uh, displacement. Um, the, one of the best things to look at is case fatality, right? Of those who fall ill with an illness, cholera, drug-resistant tuberculosis, HIV disease, you pick your poison, um, Ebola, Marburg. Looking at who lives and who dies is a second chance to think about, um, to think about equity. Dan, the paper of, uh, the title, subtitle of Dan's paper was Missed Opportunities for Prevention. And he just described very clearly that he means preventing uh, deaths as well. Um, the more these Ebola treatment units had no T in their ETU or too little, the m more likely it would be that people would flee them. And indeed, they received amazingly discrepant, confusing messages from experts in health education who, again, got some of their information from experts in the field. Looking at Marburg, which in its 1967 debut, as you might imagine, it was called Marburg because it was discovered in Marburg. And why was it discovered? Because they had the staff stuff space and systems in order to identify a new pathogen. Those were absent uh, from the continent from which it hailed. Right? But case fatality in 1967, without knowing what was going on, was obviously empiric and focused on symptomatology. Sometimes people were losing 10 liters of fluid a day. Um, Ian Crozer, who may be here, I hope he's here, he was losing 10 liters of fluid a day right, at, at some points during his illness. How do you care for someone? Well, they managed in 1967 in 
Hamburg, and I believe also across the board in U Yugoslavia, to have a case fatality rate that, though horrific at 23%, was and remains radically different from what we see with Marburg epidemics on that continent today, meaning not Europe, but Africa. And that's a good way to look at how we're doing, because there's never going to be uh, a metric by which to judge our success that's based only on publications, on new discoveries, on developing new tools. It's always going to be based on how useful those are deemed by those lo most likely to endure these illnesses. So after Ebola, if there was, if we are after it, and again, I think somebody living with its sequela would question that uh, diagnosis of after, we still failed to focus on health systems, we as a collective we. And Sierra Leone already had the highest maternal mortality in the world. And these are, of course, projections, but there's no question that whether you look at outbreaks of new pathogens, case fatality of people who were once on in programs to treat tuberculosis or HIV, or just the course of obstructed labor, right? You're going to see a worsening um, uh, in terms of performance because, just to give you one number about staff, 211 of Sierra Leone's health professionals died in the course of the epidemic. Kumar Khan and Martin Sally among them, uh, but 211. And you do the math on how many were there uh, to start with, and who wants to work in a place like that without the staff stuff, space, and systems? And I know I couldn't take it, uh, not for long. And, uh, and so that work, whether we're focused on basic science research, on developing new tools, or on delivering clinical services, that work, or just as taxpayers, right? That work requires an equity perspective, just as responding to Haiti did. The numbers that you read about pledges, um, and you, this is particularly grievous in, in, uh, for citizens in these countries because these numbers come from pledges made in international pledging conferences. I had already learned the hard way about them. That doesn't mean that these pledges will ever be dispersed or that they are new money for Ebola. In fact, nobody usually tracks them at all. This happened after the earthquake in Haiti as well. During the epi epidemic, that is the time of active transmission, less than a quarter of all these pledges ever made their way to any kind of meaningful transfer, and that doesn't account for implementation. So these patterns that we see again and again after hurricanes, and I'm finishing up, after hurricanes, after so-called natural disasters, right, and after explosive epidemics, which will happen more often in the future, they're usually the same ones. We don't think about health system strengthening. Uh, we don't think about training personnel. We don't think about strengthening um, uh, national institutions. Um, and that has been the tragedy in West Africa as well. It doesn't look that I forgot to say in one of the slides that, you know, that this was, I did say this was uh, a ward at Kenema uh, Government Hospital. But it was just as bad or, or worse in parts of Liberia that I saw. Um, this was supposedly an Ebola IC isolation unit or a community care center. Um, and nobody would go in there except to die, which is why no one ever did. The district health commissioner, who was a very fine person, a nurse who said, well, we're an Ebola-free district. And I didn't say in, the, in Zwedru, Liberia, what I was thinking, I did later because she came to Harvard, that it's a lab-free district. So how would you know? How would you know if there's Ebola? How would you know if there's Lassa? Um, without a lab, you cannot tell. And this is not the way to proceed. Um, after the earthquake in Haiti, we were granted, I had a chance to talk about this already, but we were granted a, pr a reprieve from this logic as Partners in Health because we received unsolicited donations, um, a very substantial amount of money, and we got to make our own decisions with our Haitian colleagues. Um, that didn't happen with Ebola, if I'm not mistaken. Right? These more than half of all American households donated to earthquake relief. This is the nursing school, by the way, um, after January 10th. You can imagine that none of the third year nursing students who were in session survived, and neither did their faculty members. Right? So it's the same set of problems, perhaps on a less dramatic scale in terms of loss of personnel, but 20% of the Ministry of Health employees in Port-au-Prince 
died or were maimed in that one episode. So it called for rebuilding the capacity to train Hades, nurses, doctors, health managers, allied health professionals. If anything did, it was the earthquake, which it's epicenter in the city, which took out the major teaching hospitals. Actually, you can see part of the general hospital tottering over the nursing school right there in the corner. And so we proposed, and the we here was the Ministry of Health and, and, and our partners in Haiti, building an academic medical center. And this was scoffed at by experts in public health development and disaster reliefs. Now, I can get disagreeing, but scoffing uh, is, is, is an absurd reaction because if not then, when, right? If you wouldn't invest in rebuilding academic medical centers after they were destroyed in an earthquake and build them outside of the earthquake zone, when would you do that? And, and I would argue that we're, we're at a similar uh, juncture in Upper West Africa in those three countries. This is the medical center we built. It's been open for already for years. It's trained a large number of, um, the largest number probably of Haitian physicians and nurses and, and allied health professionals. It is that empty spot now has a BSL-3 lab. I told some of you we were gonna try and do it. It's not gonna be easy to run, right? Um, we need staff, stuff, space, and systems, but again, if not now, when? Um, the other laboratories aren't functioning. And to do this without adequate clinical care uh, is something that would not be possible in the United States, at least not since the Flexner Report in 1910. Before that, you could get a medical degree, even at Harvard, I believe, without ever working in a hospital. But that's not how our colleagues in Africa or any other place that I've been uh, wish to be trained or could possibly be trained. And so some of those resources that are targeted to training the trainers and weekend workshops or having them look at PowerPoint presentations for a couple of days, um, it's a nice break for us here, um, but it doesn't work if there is, are no formal training programs. Now, I, I, I want to end on a, a positive note, although you're thinking, how is he going to do that? Um, I am an optimist because I've seen how much can be done in a relatively short amount of time in, in, in many of the places you work and many of the places we work. I've also seen, as the society has, the caliber of people who we bring from those 100 countries, young people particularly, and we have every right to be proud and to listen when, um, when they tell you how they were trained, um, which is very similar to how we were trained. They went to medical schools, they went to nursing schools, they became basic scientists, but it's a very hard row to hoe on that continent because of the lack of commitment to higher education and robust health systems. Now, Martin Salia and Humar Khan are not with us anymore, but a number of you in this room have um, tried to start, have started um, funds in their honor to keep their memories alive and, and others as well. And I would just encourage you, uh, and I hope I have the blessing of the society to mention this, I would encourage all of us to support these efforts um, in part to address the, um, well, the emptiness that was left behind, but also to again, honor the memory of these men and so many other men and women who did not survive Ebola. Thank you for allowing me um, to speak here today. And again, I hope I didn't uh, end on a, a sour note. We, we're just beginning to see the impact of integrated efforts to promote research, training, and service delivery in the places who need it most. Thank you very much. So, Paul, thank you so much, and, and I think, uh, and he is a fun person, by the way. Um, I think it reminds us to always have in the conversation um, discussion of poverty and equity and health system strengthening, that no matter whether or not we're a bench scientist or, or someone who's in the clinical world, we have to keep talking about poverty and equity. So, thank you. We do have a gift uh, to thank you for this, thank you. this evening. Thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. You have to get Mr. Chairman. Uh, I never lose these. Yeah,
Well, uh, we're now on to the next part of our agenda, our awards program. Um, first, we'd like to recognize this year's ASTMH Travel Award recipients. I think we asked you to try to sit together. Um, but for some of our young scientists, uh, a travel award from ASTMH represents, presents them with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to attend this conference, to meet with some of the real giants in our field, and to connect with friends and make new connections. With support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we have awarded 41 travel awards this year. If you've received one of these awards, please stand to be recognized. I want to thank the society and its members and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their continued support of this very important program. Next, I want to recognize the recipients of the Burroughs Welcome Fund, ASTMH Postdoctoral Fellowship in Tropical Infectious Diseases. For 18 years, this fellowship has supported the career development of physician scientists focused on infectious diseases of the developing world. Well done to this year's recipients. Tara Bouton, Patrick Cudahy, and Matthew Ippolito. Please stand to be recognized by your colleagues. Now to the results of the Young Investigators Award that judging was held only today. Each year on the afternoon before this opening plenary, Young Investigator Award applicants present the results of their research to a panel of judges. And when your name is called, please stand to be recognized. Our 2017 Young Investigator Award winners are David Markham, Colorado State University, Inca Lubis from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Alexandra Grote from New York University, Martina Ledemitt, from the University of New Mexico, Caitlin Walzer from Duke University. Our first tier mentions are Jiang Tao Liang from Virginia Tech, Charlotte Wavelings from the Academic Medical Center, University of Amsterdam, Yeo Sung Kwan from Iowa State University, Carla Mavian from the University of Florida, David Behrens from Georgia Tech, and then our honorable mentions are Raul Sariava from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Manuela Carogati from Duke University, Angela Tope from the University of Iowa, that's two from Iowa, Kenneth Gavina, University of Alberta, Sage Davis from the University of Notre Dame. Please join me in congratulating all of you. We will also post these results in the registration area, so if you see any of these young investigators during the meeting, please congratulate them. We know you've worked really hard. I also want to thank William Petrie Sr. and Dr. Ann Petrie, the Petrie family, an anonymous donor, Tech Lab, and PLOS NTDs for their very special commitment and continued support of this important program. It's essential that we recognize and support our young people who are doing such excellent work and congratulations on your achievements. Um, the presidents, the other presidents and I went to the uh, student uh, reception and, the, and as Dr. Higgs said, there was a lot of buzz in the room and there's a lot of buzz about these young investigators. So judging was also held today for the Elsevier Clinical Research Award. If your name is called, please stand to be recognized. In first place, Inca Lubis from London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Second place, Menno Smith from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in the UK. And in third place, Charlotte Wavelings from the Academic Medical Center, University of Amsterdam in the, in the Netherlands. So thank you to Elsevier for its support of this award and the judges who volunteer their time. I remember when I did that, it was a lot of fun. And congratulations again to our deserving recipients. 
As a society, we are fortunate to be able to offer a number of awards and fellowships throughout the year. This is due to the longstanding and excellent financial stewardship by ASTMH's leaders. You can see all of these awards and the lists of awardees in the program book and the meeting app, but we want to thank all the committee chairs and committee members who volunteer their time to work on these programs and make these opportunities possible. We rely heavily on you for this work and we're really grateful for the time that you put in. Now the society would like to acknowledge the 2017 fellows of ASTMH. We recognize these members for their sustained professional accomplishments in tropical medicine and related fields. This is a high bar that we set, that is set by the society and, and fellows of ASTMH recognition is available only to members of the society, all members of the society. Will each fellow please stand as I read your name? I ask that the audience please hold its applause until the end. John H. Adams, Carolina V. Barrias Murray, Robert Frederick Bremen, Robert Edelman, David O. Friedman, Mark Cordepeter, Gregory Martin, Steve Meshnick, Danny Arnold Milner, Hira Nukasi, Dauda Ndai, B. Kim Lee Sim, and Christopher W. Woods. Congratulations and thank you. Each year we also recognize international leaders in the tropical medicine field through this very special recognition, the Honorary International Fellows of the Society. These honorees are recognized for their eminent contributions to a particular aspect of tropical medicine and or hygiene. We have five honorees this year, and I, as I announce your name, please stand and be recognized by your colleagues. So going in alphabetical order, our first honorary international fellow is Jean-Jacques Muyembe. Unfortunately, Dr. Muyembe is unable to attend tonight, but I wanna tell you a bit about his work. Jean-Jacques Muyembe led investigations of seven outbreaks of Ebola virus disease in the DRC, and he consulted for the WHO in Liberia during the historic 2013 to 16 Ebola epidemic in West Africa. And after smallpox was eliminated from the DRC in the early 70s, he coordinated research for the WHO on human monkeypox, which correctly predicted that human monkeypox virus cases were not a threat to the eradication of smallpox as feared. So well done to Professor Muyembe, and we'll pass on congratulations to him. Our next honoree is Peter Kremsner. Professor Kremsner is one of the world's premier physician scientists in tropical infectious diseases and global health. He has mentored scores of highly successful African, Asian, European, and American scientists. As director of CIRMO in Gabon, Central Africa, during the past 25 years, he has established one of the premier research and training centers in Africa, resulting in scientific impact and direct public health impact in Gabon. Congratulations, Professor Kemsner. Our next honoree is James McCarthy. Dr. McCarthy is an exemplary physician scientist who built an outstanding translational and basic research career that initially was focused on lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, and hookworm, and more recently on human malaria. He has continued to make important observations related to the medical significance and control of parasitic helminth infections and ectoparasite infections endemic to the tropics, experimental hookworm infection, and experimental human blood stage malaria challenge systems involving both P. falciparum and P. vivax. Congratulations, Dr. McCarthy. Our next honoree is Dr. Jeffrey Shaw, regarded as one of the icons of New World Leishmaniasis. Dr. Shaw began a lifelong commitment of studying the protozoan pathogen, its animal reservoirs, and its sandfly vectors after contracting cutaneous leishmaniasis himself. He was performing fieldwork at the time in Costa Rica, Colombia, and Panama, 
under Professor PCC Garnham of the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in the early 1960s, based through the Gorgas Memorial Lab in Panama. Over the decades since that time, Dr. Shaw has received many awards and honors from the United Kingdom, Brazil, and the United States. Congratulations, Dr. Shaw. Our fifth and final honoree is Shyam Sundar. Dr. Sundar is renowned for advancing the chemotherapy of visceral leishmaniasis. He was a young physician when he witnessed the magnitude of VL as a clinical health problem in Bihar, India. He initiated a treatment clinic to conduct drug trials for VL in Bihar and documented the utility of amphotericin and liposomal amphotericin for the treatment of visceral leishmaniasis. He built the Kala Azar Medical Research Center and led the seminal cl clinical trial of miltefacine and peromomycin to treat visceral leishmaniasis. His studies also documented the utility of the RK39 strip diagnostic test for VL in India. Congratulations, Dr. Suntar. All of this year's recipients have contributed to our collective knowledge, and tonight we thank you and honor you. And now on to a very special honor that has personal and professional significance for every member of this society, the Alan J. McGill, McGill Fellowship. Created in 2016 by the Society's Council in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to honor the life, example, and legacy of Alan J. McGill, MD, FASTMH, our previous president, and a widely respected and recognized leader in the global tropical medicine community, who, as many of you know, passed away suddenly in 2015. The McGill Fellowship provides $50,000 in funding for up to two years to one recipient. These funds will support mentorship and career and or leadership development projects for one member annually in their early to mid careers and serving in low and low and middle income countries with a focus on leadership development in tropical medicine. Much like what Alan did with others, the unique feature of this fellowship is the support of career broadening experiences to enhance professional development and leadership opportunities beyond those that may be traditionally available from within the applicant's home organization. And in so doing, equip awardees to, to assume leadership and mentoring roles in various aspects of tropical medicine. We're very proud to announce our first McGill Fellow is Dr. Pedro Aide, a member from Mozambique. Dr. Aide, will you please join me on the stage? Let me tell you a bit about Dr. Aide. He's an epidemiologist with a decade of experience in the design, implementation, and analysis of a series of clinical trials of the pre-erythrocytic candidate malaria vaccine, RTSS, as well as other studies on the prevention and control of malaria. During his two-year fellowship, in part with the WHO Global Malaria Program, Dr. Aide will become deeply involved in all aspects of malaria elimination and certification led by the WHO in different malarial settings. On behalf of the society and all of us who were inspired by our friend Alan, we are very pleased to recognize you as the first McGill Fellow, the first of a cohort of 20 over the next 20 years. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Maybe he'll get a little less shy in the future. <laughs> Our next honor is the Harry Hoogstrell Medal. The recipient of this year's medal is Willem Takken of Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Dr. Takken, will you please stand and be recognized?
ACME will be honoring Dr. Takin further during its annual business meeting and awards presentation on Tuesday afternoon, but just a, a few comments about you, Dr. Takin, an outstanding medical entom entomologist with over 40 years of experience in basic and applied research on the vectors of African sleeping sickness, dengue, and malaria, and encompassing the translation of field evidence of effectiveness into policy. Congratulations again. Our next award is the Communications Award. Please welcome Executive Director Karen Goraleski, a co-chair of the Communications Committee. So um, I, do I look like Dr. Peter Hotez? I know I don't tweet like Dr. Hotez. Um, he is the other chair of the Communications Committee and he was unable to be here tonight, so I'm filling in for him. The Communications Award is a society-level award recognizing excellence in tropical medicine storytelling through the written word. As we all recognize, today there's an urgency for accurate reporting of science to non-science audiences. Communications Award entries are submitted throughout the year and judged on their ability to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation of tropical medicine research, clinical practice, and or policy. If there's ever a time for a, a need for clear communications, we're in it right now. And I think it's important that the society, a very heavy duty research organization, recognizes the importance of clear communication to non-science audiences. So before we announce this year's winning submission, we wanna give an honorary mention to the article, Turning the Tide Against Cholera, by Donald G. McNeil, Jr., which appeared in the New York Times on February 6th. So this year's winning entry for the 2017 Communications Award is, is titled, Why a, Kenyan Arctic, excuse me, Why a Kenyan Island May Teach the World How to Beat AIDS. It aired on the PBS NewsHour on July 20th, 2016, through the combined efforts of William Brangham, John Cohen, Jason Kane. The story, which received some support from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, reported on a massive HIV test and treat study underway in Kenya and Uganda where migratory men in the fishing industry had been hit especially hard and researchers are trying to create creative ways to engage them to get tested for HIV. Jason Kane will accept the award on behalf of himself and his colleagues. Jason, would you please join us on stage? First of all, thank you so much for this honor. My reporting colleagues, William Brangham and John Cohen, wish they could be here with us this evening. We're incredibly grateful for the recognition and equally grateful that we've had the opportunity to do this series in the first place. Last year, when the build up to the presidential election dominated US news coverage, the PBS NewsHour, Science Magazine, and the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting allowed the three of us to devote the better part of six months to a series on the AIDS epidemic. Amid political conventions, mass violence, and escalating global tensions, we were given the time and the resources to travel to six places around the world to listen to researchers and scientists and people living with HIV speak in plain language about their efforts to prevent and treat and care. We were trusted to share their stories with the world, and when we did, millions of people paid attention. For good reason. At a time when hope is desperately needed, these were, for the most part, stories of unexpected hope. Throughout the world, small groups of people are demonstrating that even without a cure, progress can be made quickly against the HIV epidemic. By implementing a basic formula, getting 90% of people within a population tested for HIV, getting 90% of them onto treatment, and 90% of those people to be virally suppressed, health officials may be able to break the back of the epidemic within a matter of years. We witnessed progress not only in San Francisco where this blueprint was first mapped, but in many other hard hit corners of the globe. Kenyan fishing islands, South African townships, Atlanta's suburbs. In New York City, 
and in a district in Rwanda that recently prevented all mother-to-child transmissions for the third straight year in a row. Hope is emerging. <laughs> Nearly a year and a half ago today, the news hour's Gwen Eiffel helped to introduce these stories on our nightly broadcast. She was so proud of this aid series because she believed that stories like these, complex and undertold and driven by solid facts, are worth telling when louder voices and more shocking stories dominate the news cycle. We lost Gwen to endometrial cancer nearly a year ago today, but her guidance continues to inspire our work. She once gave this advice to a group of graduates. There's information to be had, facts to share, solutions to discover, but you have to look up. Thank you to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, Science Magazine, and PBS NewsHour for providing us with the resources and platforms to do this work. But we also want to thank all of you, the scientists and researchers, activists, and patients who help us to look up and take notice. Your work and the stories you help us tell are needed now more than ever. Thank you so much. Now we move on to the Bailey K. Ashford Medal, which honors distinguished work in tropical medicine. Will Lawrence Moulton please come to the stage to present the Ashford Medal to Margaret Kosick. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be here to present uh, Dr. Kosek for this award. I first met Margaret about 15 years ago when she was staying in a little shack in Lima known as Bob Gilman's Guest House. At that time, I didn't know that just a few years after that she'd be in the Amazon uh, rainforest maintaining a laboratory that she set up, which has served as a critical site in the MAL-ED uh, study consortium, as well as supporting many other uh, cohort studies. Uh, but I should have been able to tell because she was a very serious person. Well, that alone, uh, setting up that lab was enough to deserve a major award, I'd say, in tropical medicine, but she's done a lot more in her contributions to science. This year alone, she'll have over a dozen uh, publications that she's the first or senior author on. Uh, she'll be uh, telling us uh, about those uh, later on the, in, in the year in various forms, but. Uh, they deal with a myriad relationships between intestinal permeability, and environmental enteropathy, fecal markers, uh, infant and child growth. She's been a tremendous colleague to us as well. Uh, she's been helping us out in, with the Zimbabwean uh, SHINE trial, uh, the trial of uh, WASH and nutrition interventions. She's been critical to our uh, understanding of the, how to interpret uh, lactulose mannitol tests, uh, how to characterize environmental adderopathy. Uh, as we get the lab results, uh, it'll be even more important to have her just down the hall. At uh, Johns Hopkins University, where she's uh, last year she became an associate professor uh, in our uh, Global Disease Epidemiology Control Program within our Department of International Health, she's been a key faculty member. And it's not surprising that our strongest students have gravitated to her. She takes her student mentoring role very seriously and has provided some amazing opportunities for research and publishing to her doctoral students. Uh, I should have uh, put a slide up that shows the, the reverse side of the Bailey K. Ashford medal. Among other things, it has a dung beetle on it. Well, she has a tenacity of a dung beetle, but that's not why I'm mentioning it. I'm mentioning it because uh, Besides humans, it's the only creature known to use the Milky Way to navigate. So why am I saying that? <laughs> well, it's because in the coming decades, many of us here today will be navigating by that true star that is Margaret Kosek. Well done. 
<laughs> Very impressive. Okay. Um, well, I was going to start by uh, thanking the audience. It's truly an honor to get this award. Um, it's really humbling to be here in front of you, so many of you who are friends and colleagues, and some of the people that I admire most. Um, I'm here at the society that I feel at home at, uh, where people come and who are interested not only in science and discovery, but in service and in equity and dedicating themselves to things that matter. Paul Farmer said it best, it's a, a society of nice people. It's a meeting of nice people. I am truly honored um, to be here and, and, and share this with you. I did go with my family when I went to Peru uh, 14 years ago. And my passion about what I do and um, a lot of the energy of the work I do is uh, shared by them, a lot of the work too, by my husband Pablo, who's here in the second row, and two uh, small assistants. I was the only one crazy enough to bring small children, but I know a lot of you are crazy too. Maybe I just don't see them because of the lights. Um, I've had some of the finest mentors that I, anyone could ever hope for. Um, uh, I work with Larry down the hall who helped me write my first K grant and um, still helps me today in moments of greatest need. Um, I have worked, uh, I did a postdoc with Dick Garant, who is an amazing mentor, who after 18 years I can still pick up the phone in my lowest moment and find someone who believes in me and who uh, will share an idea or tell me I probably need to redirect my efforts. <laughs> um, I also had a lot of help from other people at UVA, including Eric Hout, who continues to help me today, and uh, Bill Petrie, who can always uh, be counted on, uh, Richard Oberhelman, uh, Bob Gilman, uh, Hugo Garcia, um, a lot of really fine people that I've had uh, the privilege of working with. So um, thank you very much, very honored. Thank you, Dr. Moulton, and congratulations, Dr. Kosek. I'm gonna remember that about dung beetles. <laughs> Our next award is the Donald Mackay Award. Since 1990, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene have joined together to award the Mackay Medal which recognizes outstanding work in tropical health, especially relating to improvements in the health of rural or urban workers in the tropics. Tonight marks our 27th year in this partnership, and I would like to acknowledge Simon Cathcart, the president of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and Tamar Ghosh, the CEO of the Royal Society. Thank you both for this collaboration and for being with us tonight. The Mackay Medal is pre presented in alternate years by the American Society and the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Will Daniel Colley please come to the stage to present the Mackay Medal to Patrick Lamy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, and thank you very much to both the Royal Society and the American Society. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Patrick J. Lammy uh, as the 2017 Donald Mackay Medalist. Uh, this is our year to give it, and uh, we're glad that Pat is one of us. Uh, he gets this medal because of his outstanding credentials in the world of neglected tropical diseases. But Pat started his career as an immunoparasitologist, sort of sorting out the immune mechanisms and, in experimental and human uh, filariasis. He studied the pathogenesis and how to alleviate the resulting morbidity. However, he's also spent many years nimbly running the gamut, or maybe the gauntlet, of the whole spectrum of global health from basic science, to field studies, to operational research, to policy, and to implementation. Now, as all of you know, research discoveries are essential, but it is when they are led, when they lead to improved policies 
and programmatic interventions that they improve people's lives and become valuable in public health. I think that Dr. Farmer mentioned this in his talk. Pat Lammy has uniquely used his training to move in highly active and effective memberships and leadership roles in key committees that provide direction, accountability for all of the huge NTD programs, intervention programs, managed by many partners and led by the WHO. These are programs that provided treatment to more than one billion people in 2016. And Pat was just a part of that, but he was a very important part. One of Pat's nomination letters states, what sets him apart is his determination to understand, respect, and help guide large organizations that have unique opportunities to support the spectrum of research needed to define solutions for global health problems and to affect policy changes based on data. A theme that runs throughout all of Pat's nomination letters has to do with his personal attributes. They help explain his success in global health in this broad arena. These include, and I quote, excellent diplomacy skills, not to be denied, a calm demeanor, also helpful, fairness, integrity, a willingness to listen, and an insistence on evidence-based decisions, unquote. While in other states, his inclusiveness, openness, and communication skills ensure respect from all partners and all collaborators in the complex and interconnected environment of the NTD community. These statements describe Pat very well, and they describe what it takes to get the job done when the job is turning data into policies and policies into implemented programs. So on behalf of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and the hundreds of millions of those who have benefited from his tireless efforts across the spectrum of global health, I'm pleased to give you Dr. Patrick J. Lammy, this year's Mackay Medalist. going to be hard to uh, follow those comments, uh, Dan. Thank you so, so very, very much. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I think I can count on having uh, Dan's support for really uh, my entire professional career since I was a graduate student. Anyway, I'm, I'm uh, honored and humbled as well at uh, receiving the 2017 uh, Donald Mackay Medal. I'm actually humbled multiple times, first for the, the nomination at all, and then the letters of support from esteemed colleagues. I think it's really important also to acknowledge that equally humbling to be getting individual recognition in what I've always considered to be a, a team sport. Um, I'm very fortunate to have worked with and been mentored by many of the previous uh, awardees of the Mackay Medal, starting with the original award winner, uh, Ray Henderson, but also including uh, Eric Otteson, Alan Fennick, David Molyneux, Gary Weil, and most recently, uh, Moses Bakary. It's really an incredible honor for me to join such a distinguished list of awardees. As many people who stand up here before you uh, getting these types of acknowledgements, I do have a long list of people to thank, but starting especially with my uh, wife, uh, Maureen, and uh, family. Uh, I think the a comment that many of us would share is that they've been incredibly uh, tolerant over the years, both of the travel and uh, the work schedule, and uh, that's certainly something important to uh, bear in mind. 
I have a, really owe a special debt of gratitude to uh, CDC. As Dan mentioned, I started as an immunoparasitologist with a real focus on uh, lab models of experimental filariasis. CDC gave me the opportunity to pivot and to start thinking about applying those uh, skills in the, the field and to apply those to public health questions, which of course were a source of great satisfaction for me. CDC provided me with great collaborators, uh, including uh, Mark Eberhard, Harrison Spencer, Dan, of course, uh, Frank Richards, uh, Dave Addis, Michael Beach, uh, Jeff Priest, Dylan Moss, and most recently, Kim Wan. And I'm very uh, lucky to have learned from uh, all of them. I think, in closing, it's, it's such a tremendous privilege to be afforded the opportunity to work on the development of public health programs for diseases that were literally left off the map and off the radar uh, for so many years, but as Dan pointed out, are now the targets of global programs that are reaching more than a billion people a year. It's a professional opportunity for which I'm incredibly grateful. You know, we're, we're very fortunate as a scientist to be able to look forward to the day uh, when these infections are no longer the scourge of humanity, and to be able to participate in such an effort is just an incredible gift. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Colley, and congratulations again, Patrick. Our next award is the Walter Reed Medal. The Walter Reed Medal recognizes distinguished accomplishment in the field of tropical medicine. Will Dr. Avarinda De Silva please come to the stage to present the Walter Reed Medal to Dr. Scott Halstead. Dr. De Silva is with the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in the United States. So, so when I was first asked to um, introduce Scott to this audience, my first thought was, does Scott Halstead really need an introduction to this society? Nevertheless, it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure to um, introduce Dr. S uh, Scott Halstead, who's the recipient of the Walter Reed Medal this year. I'm actually here on behalf of um, also Wai Kung Wang from the University of Hawaii, who also co-nominated Dr. Halstead for this award. About 10 years ago, um, in an interview in uh, Lancet, um, the person who was interviewing Scott asked him what his greatest fear was, and he, Scott said his greatest fear was uh, losing his sense of uh, adventure. And I really don't think that has happened. Uh, he's certainly had a very adventurous life, uh, traveling all over the world, making uh, important discoveries that continue to this day um, at the age of 86. Um, I have a few slides. Um, um, are the slides going to come up? No slides. Okay, so I guess we've had a technical issue with, sli with the slides. So, um, Scott was born in 1930 um, in India, and, um, and he completed his uh, bachelor's degree um, at Yale, where he majored in sociology um, in 1951, uh, followed by um, his MD in 1955 um, at Columbia. Um, soon after that, he was uh, draft, uh, drafted into the Army, and he spent about eight years in the Army, which included five years in Thailand. Um, and this is where he discovered his life's work and passion, um, dengue and um, related uh, arboviruses. Um, while in uh, Thailand, he also set up the Seattle um, uh, Army uh, Medical Research Lab and ended up uh, being the director of that lab. And um, after that, he came back to the U.S., uh, spent some time at Yale, uh, where he worked with Wilbur Downs and Jody Casals, uh, clearly giants in, in arbovirology. Um, and from there onwards, he went to the University of Hawaii, where he was for many years at the Department of Tropical Medicine, where he ended up being the chair of that program. And then this was followed by a period um, at the Rockefeller Foundation, where he directed uh, a lot of their health programs. And while at the Rockefeller Foundation, he he founded um, the Children's Vaccine Initiative. And most recently, um, Scott, together with Duane Gubler, um, also initially with support from the Rockefeller Foundation, 
as well as uh, subsequently from the Gates Foundation, uh, they uh, set up the Pediatric Dengue Vaccine Initiative, which is now morphed into the Dengue Vaccine Initiative, which has really had a tremendous impact on bringing basic uh, research um, um, into um, implementation, development and implementation of dengue vaccines. So, so how do I summarize Scott's uh, scientific contributions um, to our virology? Um, as you, in this meeting over the next few days, I think maybe some of you might um, not agree with me, but I think flaviviruses probably are this, going to the second most discussed group of pathogens at this meeting after malaria. Well, in 1963, in Thailand, Scott was one of the first person to actually culture dengue in cell culture. This is how far back his involvement in this field goes. Then in the mid-1960s, through a series of um, careful observational and epidemiological studies of people who were experiencing severe dengue hemorrhagic fever, Scott proposed the, the, uh, the concept, the idea of the two infection theory, uh, sequential infections leading to severe dengue through antibody-enhanced disease. Um, subsequently, in the 1970s, he was the first person to use primary uh, primate cells to actually show that in vitro, uh, FC receptor-bearing cells could actually enhance the infection of uh, dengue. And the, while the, the theory of um, antibody-enhanced disease has been widely debated, I think it's, it's really um, appropriate that we are recognizing Scott this week because um, this week in science, there's a very interesting uh, paper from um, Leah Katzelnik and colleagues um, in Eva Harris's lab at Berkeley, in my mind, showing some of the strongest evidence for uh, sub-neutralizing levels of uh, dengue antibodies enhancing severe uh, dengue disease. This is through a long-term study uh, that Eva Harris has conducted in Thailand. Um, so more recently, Scott's, uh, he's published over 300 papers. His, his work has focused mo much more on vaccines and prevention. And, and when I sort of think about S Scott's contributions, I've known Scott for now for about 15 years, what really stands out is he's, he's, at heart, Scott is a bench scientist. There's nothing that he loves more than um, looking at data and looking at neutralizing antibody titers. Um, but what's really uncanny um, about uh, Scott is his ability to really pay attention to details, understand really excellent basic research without losing focus of uh, practical solutions, either in the clinical arena, vaccines, and in, in this regard, he's really been a beacon to many of the uh, sort of you know, younger scientists who have all these fancy bells and whistles, but really lose sight of the, the, the final goal of these studies, which is to come up with, with practical and realistic solutions. Um, so I'm going to finish by just um, also recognizing Scott's um, uh, long-term contribution to this society. He actually joined this society in 1960. Um, he served as the president of this society in 1991, um, and um, he's continued to, he received the, the McKay Award a few years ago, and he's also a fellow of this society. Um, before I finish, I also want to recognize Scott's family, who's here, including his wife, Todd, who's in the audience. And finally, Scott is not done with dengue. He's going to continue keeping us on our toes. He's going to also continue to stir up healthy debate as we approach uh, the finishing line uh, towards an uh, effective dengue vaccine. So Scott, uh, I invite you to come up and accept this uh, award on behalf of the society. Well, thank you very much, Aravinda and uh, Wei Kung Wong and others who have uh, supported my nomination. I have to say that uh, Aravinda and Wei Kung are both heroes to me because they've mastered the neutralization test. <laughs> for the, for the, that's, that's an in-joke in, in dengue field. Uh, th there are um, many people in the audience who probably think that I joined the Army about the same time that Walter Reed did. Uh, it's a slight exaggeration, but we did both uh, go to Cuba 
he, he went in uh, 1900 in the midst of a, uh, an outbreak of yellow fever. I went uh, about 80 years later in the next large outbreak uh, transmitted by Aedes aegypti, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Um, I, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that uh, I owe everything to the Army, because I was drafted out of, of uh, residency, sent to Japan. I didn't even know the Army had medical research programs, and spent 11 years in the Army, and I don't want to focus just on the Army because the Navy as well, both the Army and Navy have a series of overseas laboratories and have been the uh, venue for introducing many distinguished members from our society to, uh, to, to, to tropical medicine and medical science. So I'm, I'm terribly grateful to, to the U.S. Army, but I think all of us in the room owe a, a, a shout out of appreciation for, the, for the, the last two generations, the last 40 years of, of, uh, of our ex existence where governments and international agencies have really invested heavily in this field and enabled most of us have, to have these really remarkable and exciting careers. So I'm very grateful for this uh, incredible opportunity that I've had in my life. As, as Aravinda says, lots of movement. My wife and, and oldest boy are here. They've been uh, <laughs> the uh, unwitting participants in that movement. But anyhow, we've, we've had a, a great time. I've uh, enjoyed this society and always enjoy the being here every year. So thanks again. Thank you again, Dr. De Silva, and congratulations, Dr. Halstead. Well, our next and final award makes history for the ASTMH tonight. Dr. Stephen Higgs, will you please join me on the stage? Those of you who were attending last year's award ceremony in Atlanta will recall that Steve announced that we would have at this meeting the first society level medal named after an iconic woman in tropical medicine. And he reminded us it's taken us since 1903 to do this. Earlier this year, we solicited nominations from the tropical medicine community and we were delighted but not surprised to receive the names of 57 outstanding women. Ultimately, we narrowed it down to one name, Dr. Hicks. The medal is named after Clara Southmaid Ludlow. She joined the society in 1908. She was the first woman member and also the first non-physician member of our society. She was a female entomologist with scientific zeal and tenacity. I guess all entomologists are like that. But she battled the odds of age, and she battled odds of her gender. She was here at a time when there was skepticism of women in science. She achieved a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD at a time when women were not really able to succeed in academia. Clara was a scientist who was not afraid to challenge giants in the field. If some of you have read some of the things that she read, she, she had an amazing way with words, and she was quite willing to tell uh, older men when they were wrong. Um, her work represents success despite obstacles, and her life's work advanced the understanding of tropical medicine. She was remarkable and talented, unafraid, and certainly unapologetic for her work and her success. Recipients of the Ludlow Medal will represent the best of Clara's qualities. It's open to, to women and to men. Um, individuals receiving this medal will be honored for their inspirational and pioneering spirit, for their ability to persist despite the odds and contribute to understanding and advancement of tropical medicine. You will be able to read more in an upcoming um, article in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. 
So it's our honor to announce the first recipient of the Clara Southmate Ludlow Award is Dr. Ruth Nussenswein. An MD and PhD, Dr. Nussenzweig's extraordinary contributions forever changed malaria vaccine research. At a time when it was thought that a malaria vaccine was impossible, her work with her husband and collaborator, Victor Nussenzweig, showed otherwise, paving the way for today's malaria vaccine efforts. She has been described as focused, creative, and with a powerful, indomitable personality. Among her many recognitions, she is an elected member of the National Academies of Science. In 1997, she was the first female recipient of our society's Joseph Augustine Le Prince Medal. And for most of her long career, she was an active ASTMH member. She published over 250 papers during a 50-year period, with 24 of those papers published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Dr. Nussenzweig is unable to be here tonight, uh, but we are sending a video of this evening so that she can uh, enjoy for herself the honor and the gratitude that this society feels towards her accomplished career. We are pleased to announce that one of her sons, Andre, is in the audience tonight, along with one of her grandsons, Julian, and I'm supposed to say hi, Samuel. He couldn't make it tonight. And welcome and thanks for sharing this very special moment with us. So Andre is accepting the medal on his mother's behalf. Andre, please come to the stage. And a really fun part of this is that we also have, thanks to Dr. Higgs and, and genealogy sleuthing, two of, Dr., uh, of Clara Ludlow's relatives who are with us tonight, Elizabeth Thomas and Sarah Brown Blake. Would you also please come to the stage? So uh, Elizabeth is standing in the middle. We had a delightful reception with them. She's a second year postdoc student in the Social and Behavioral Interventions Program in the Department of International Health at Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health here in Baltimore. And Sarah Blake, she just got back from the Congo. Um, Sarah Blake Brown is a postdoc scholar at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at the University of California, Davis. Her professional nursing experience is rooted in community and public health with a focus on maternal child health and adolescent health, and she just defended her dissertation. So clearly the spirit of Clara Ludlow is in their DNA. Elizabeth and Sarah, we're so pleased to have you here tonight. I think, uh, Elizabeth, you'll be saying something? Thank you, Dr. Parker. Uh, we are thrilled to have been invited to be a part of this award ceremony and to represent Clara Ludlow's family. Thank you to the Society and the Awards Committee for recognizing her, her contributions to the organization and to science in this um, amazing way. Just over a year ago, our extended family made a pilgrimage to Arlington National Cemetery to inter our grandfather. We wandered the grounds, visiting over a century's worth of uh, family headstones. Clara, our grandfather's gr uh, great aunt, was our final stop. We took pictures, discussed her work, marveled at her fascinating life mm -hmm. and the trails she blazed. It was particularly signific a significant experience for me and Elizabeth. Um, as Dr. Walker described, I'm a public health nurse and a postdoctoral scholar at UC Davis and fo currently focusing on equitable access to clean and affordable drinking water in, San, in the San Joaquin Valley in California um, under the mentorship of Dr. Jill Joseph. And, and I am a second year doctoral student in international health here in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins focusing in uh, community and hospital-based water sanitation and hygiene interventions under the mentorship of Dr. Christine Marie George and my advisor Peter Winch with ongoing field work in uh, the United States, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and in Bangladesh. And we are the first in our family, male or female, 
to uh, pursue careers in science since Clara. As we stood by Clara's headstone that day, uh, we noticed the engraving and we were struck by it. It reads, daughter of Jacob. Her father was a US Army surgeon during the Civil War, but it wasn't, wasn't quite filling uh, Clara's history. So it is particularly gratifying that we get to recognize Clara today and her legacy nearly 110 years after she became the first woman to acquire membership to this organization with the naming of the first society level medal named after a female leader in tropical medicine. We think she would have been thrilled by the number of women in the audience today and the women who continue to pave the way and by the incredible work of the award's first recipient, uh, Dr. Nuth, uh, Ruth Nissenweig. Thank you very much, Elizabeth and Sarah. So we've actually cast two medals. Uh, one is for your family, and we'd like to give that to you. And then we've cast a medal, of course, for Dr. Nussenzweig, our first recipient. And we'd like to ask you to give that medal so that history passes on this way. Thank you. So uh, Ruth is uh, really grateful to the Ludlow family and um, to everyone at the American Society of Tropical Medicine. Prizes like this are truly an honor and Ruth is grateful to all her collaborators, students, mentors, everyone who contributed to her uh, research throughout her career. Um, Ruth has been conducting uh, malaria research since the 1960s, and I think a key moment in her research occurred in 1967 uh, when she discovered that she could induce an immune response in mice by injecting them with an irradiated malaria parasite. At that point, she and her husband, my uh, dad, uh, Victor, began collaborating, and, and together they discovered that this immune response was linked to a protein on the surface of the parasite called CSP, a potential target for pr protective antibodies. And I was pretty young at the time. I didn't really understand what this was about, but I could really feel the excitement uh, when they uh, finally cloned this uh, gene. And further experiments in animal models subsequently demonstrated that subunits of this protein um, created an immune response that prevented infectious molecules from binding to cells in the liver. And this work has been the basis of the RTS vaccine for malaria. And it's the first and to date the only vaccine that shows a protective effect against malaria among young children in phase three clinical trials. The WHO announced this year that Ghana, Kenya, and Malawa, Malawi would participate in the malaria vaccine implementation program that will make the RTS vaccine uh, available in selected areas of these three countries in 2018. So this marks a really an important step towards making the vaccine available on a global scale. Uh, thus, Ruth's work, which she started almost 60 years ago, about the time that I was born, actually, um, will continue to impact millions of lives globally, particularly in developing countries. Both for herself and Victor, one of the greatest sources of pleasure in their lives has been the knowledge that their joint efforts have contributed towards the eradication of one of humanity's most deadly disease, which has been a global scourge for millennia. Although she retired from lab work, she continues to this day to actively follow research in parasitology and vaccine development. And I know that Ruth uh, would have liked to have been here not only to accept the award, but also to meet and discuss with colleagues, collaborators, friends, and scientists uh, who are working tirelessly to make progress in resolving the problem of tropical infectious disease. 
This meeting exemplifies the joyful engagement in research for which Clara Ludlow was most admired by her colleagues. And on a personal level, as her son, it's truly an honor for me to accept the Ludlow Medal on uh, Ruth's behalf. So thank you very much. So thank you, Elizabeth Thomas, um, Sarah Bl Brown Blake, and Andrew Nussenzweig. And once again, I want to thank Dr. Steve Higgs for his dedication and support of all women in our society. As president last year, you made this a priority. Thank you very much, Steve. What a spectacular evening this has been, and this is only the first night. Thank you all for staying, for celebrating our members' achievements and accomplishments and careers in their early stages. We wish you all the best, young investigators. It's been a pleasure for me to host tonight's event, and I hope you are as inspired and humbled as I am. What a great way to start three and a half days of scientific discourse. This concludes our opening session. Please join us and our wonderful 2017 exhibitors here in Swing Hall for the opening reception, Level 100. Thank you.